we got Kelly. You've been coming back for what four or five years now. This is the fourth year. Yeah. And you are not. They haven't given you a right title yet. They keep seeing give you intern. Every interim. time I come, I have a new title. You do, but yeah. it, no. You, last year, I think you still had the same one, didn't you? Interim. Interim. Yeah. Is, is that like you know you're a girl, so you're not you know the president oh. yet? No, it's um, for the time being temporary. We'll see how things go. So everybody write the secular coalition. Co Secular.org and tell them that <laughs> just make the woman the be the president so you can do her job. Will that help? I'll do it. It would. Trust me. People listen. Well, listen to the speech first. See what you think. Yeah, maybe you might. Maybe I hate the speech. So <laughs> wait. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to talk about um, anti-vax. Right. Anti-vaxxers. That, that's a that's a cool secular topic because people don't talk about that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, they talk about it, but doing something about it because that's we, what secular coalitions about is. Action. Okay, so you, we sit around and talk about all these problems, but what are we going to do about them? So you, the people are want to get rid of like the thyme, Mars, all and all the the vaccines, but you want to take them also to get the holy holy water out too. I'll let you explain. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get into it. Hi everyone, thanks for spending your Saturday night with me in the uh, Skep Track. Thanks to to Derek and everyone for having me back. You all put on a really excellent program here and. It is my favorite thing to do every year. Love coming here, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm glad to see some of you came back for more. <laughs> so a little bit about me before we get started. Um, my name is Kelly Damaro. I'm the interim executive director of the Secular Coalition for America. We're a nonprofit based in Washington, DC. I'm originally from Florida, not too far south of here. I went to the University of Florida where I got my bachelor's and master's in education and taught kindergarten for a year. Then I went back to UF for law school. Go Gators, if there's any Gators in the crowd. <laughs> Seminole in the crowd, obviously. Um, and then I moved to DC to change the world. And uh, that's shockingly harder than you'd think it would be. I got into the secular movement working in the legal department of the American Humanist Association. And when a spot opened up with the Secular Coalition, the lobbyists for atheists, I jumped on it. And I've been there since 2012. I discovered uh, when meeting new people after graduating law school that uh, it was a lot easier to introduce myself as a kindergarten teacher than as a lawyer. People like kindergarten teachers better than lawyers. And they like anything better than a lobbyist. And it's been an interesting uh, couple of years. What I talk about are two of the three things that you're not supposed to bring up in polite company, religion and politics. And bringing them up in small talk uh, with the leaders of our country is my job. And I don't want you to just take my word for it because I know we have a room of good skeptics here. Uh, so I'll say that more than anecdotal evidence, uh, Gallup actually did a poll last year showing that people do like kindergarten teachers better than they like lawyers and lobbyists. Uh, up here at the top, you can see the grade school teachers. People think they're very honest, very ethical. Big drop down, there are the lawyers. And oh, look at the bottom of the list, you have lobbyists. Below car salesmen, even below Congress. It's really far down there. And then add um, atheists on top of that. And sometimes I tell people what I do just to get their reaction. And it's, it's a lot of fun, and it's a really uh, important job that we do at the Secular Coalition. So our mission is to increase visibility and respect for non-theist viewpoints and to protect and strengthen the secular character of our government because we truly believe that's the best way to guarantee freedom for everybody. And we've achieved that mission through advocating on behalf of non-theistic and secular Americans. And some of the issues that we lobby on are health and safety, so women's health care, uh, death with dignity, education. This year we blocked a bill that would send $35 billion, billion with a B, dollars of federal taxpayer monies, make that available to religious schools through vouchers. That money would be taken from uh, the federal money that's set aside for children in poverty and children with disabilities. Meanwhile, the schools don't have to comply with any of the rules that the public schools do about making the, the classrooms accommodatable for these children. Uh, so that's 
one example of something we worked on this year, discrimination, religiously motivated discrimination, a lot of LGBT work there, government and tax policy, all the exemptions that religious organizations are given. Uh, in the military where religion is given special privileging and if you don't fall into line, you are punished. And global, so both supporting countries that have uh, blasphemy laws in the books as well as acting on climate change. We also do a number of campaigns, particularly grassroots campaigns, in response to the Supreme Court Hobby Lobby decision. We did a campaign called Knit a Brick. We asked if the Hobby Lobby decision made you so angry you could knit a brick. <laughs> and had um, supporters knit red bricks or sponsor them. And we said if we got 400 of them, we'd sew them into this big wall and march between Supreme Court and Congress. We got 1,600 bricks and our office was covered in red yarn. But we, we stayed up all night and we knit them all together and we marched them from the Supreme Court uh, to Congress and brought some awareness to how angry people were around that decision. We're founding partner of Openly Secular. It's a campaign to eliminate discrimination and increase acceptance by asking secular people to be open about their non-belief. We're also a big participant in Darwin Day. Uh, we work to increase awareness of science and humanity by celebrating Darwin's accomplishments on his birthday. And this year, for the first time in history, we were able to get a resolution introduced into the US Senate recognizing Darwin Day. We also work on the No Hate, No Exceptions campaign that we uh, generated to show support for the LGBT organizations that we work with, saying that in all these amazing strides that they're making, there shouldn't be exemptions in their anti-discrimination laws saying, well, you can discriminate against these people if you are doing it for a religious purpose. But today I want to talk to you about the most important campaign that we've done yet um, and, and tell you a little bit more about it. It's called Put Kids First. This is a nationwide, state-by-state -state legislative campaign to save children's lives by rolling back unnecessary non-medical vaccine exemptions. And what we're talking about here, it is currently the law that you have to, uh, when you're entering public school, you have to be vaccinated. And there are three types of exemptions to get out of those mandatory vaccinations. There are medical exemptions. If you have a medical reason that you can't receive that vaccine, you're exempt. A religious exemption, if your religion objects to uh, getting a vaccination, you can be exempt. Or a personal belief exemption, you just don't believe you should be getting these vaccines. <laughs> Snickers from the corner. What the Secular Coalition for America does is we advocate for policy that's based on science and research and evidence. Policies that apply to all Americans shouldn't be based on individual beliefs or dogma. And the law should never allow the exercise of uh, personal belief or dogma to cause harm, particularly to children, because those are the ones who are really at risk with these exemptions. Children who cannot be vaccinated for medical reasons, they depend on the vaccination of their peers to keep them safe. In recent years, the spread of misinformation and fear has caused a spike in the number of parents using these exemptions as loopholes to opt out of vaccines. As a result, we're seeing deadly diseases that have been eradicated coming back, and it's the children that are paying the price for this. Uh, so an example of a disease that's making an unfortunate comeback is measles. In 2000, the United States declared that measles was eliminated from this country. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> Since then, the number of cases has been steadily on the rise and it peaked last year with 668 cases. 188 have been reported so far in 2015 and that data takes a little while to catch up. These cases are spread across 24 states, and that includes the state of Georgia and the state of Florida. That's why it's a nationwide campaign, because contagious diseases don't respect state lines. And for the first time in over a decade, a few weeks ago, someone died from measles. But it's not just measles. We've also seen a resurgence in pertussis, uh, better known as whooping cough. During 2012, 48,277 cases of pertussis were reported to the CDC, including 20 pertussis-related deaths. 
This is the most reported cases since 1955. The majority of these deaths were among infants, three months or younger. Children are the most vulnerable members of our community and it's up to us to stand up and protect them. A little bit more about these exemptions and whether or not they impact you. Currently, 47 states have religious exemptions. Of those 47 states, 19 also have personal belief exemptions, meaning parents in that state can double dip on the reason they want to uh, get out of vaccination. Only three states do not have either exemption. As of June of this year, California. Way to go, California. Does anyone know the other two states? Mississippi. Yeah, yeah, Mississippi. And I heard it, West Virginia. Yeah. Those are the countries that are leading on this, or the states that are leading on this. So, bef But before California, that meant 98.5% of Americans lived in a state that had an exemption. With California, 86% of Americans live in a risky state, and only 14 lucky percent live in a state that do have, or that do not have these exemptions. You might think, okay, well, the medical exemptions are there, so that risk is gonna be there. Is it really such a big deal to have this extra little exemption in place? Well, for kindergartners that started in the 2013 year, of those that took exemptions, 87% took religious or personal belief exemptions, and only 13% needed that exemption for medical reasons. When you're talking numbers in California, for example, which won't be the case in the future, but in 2013, they had about 1,000 medical exemptions for kindergartners starting school, and they had more than 17,000 philosophical exemptions. Each one of those children is putting other children and other adults even at risk. In Florida, 800 medical exemptions, and they don't have a philosophical exemption, but they had over 4,000 religious exemptions. So why are parents doing this? Why are they opting out? Well, 78% say they believe that kids are getting too many shots. 63% say they fear serious side effects. 77% say they don't think their medical professional has their child's best interests at heart. <laughs> and 57% still say they think vaccines cause autism. 57, over half of the parents who don't get their kids vaccinated. Of the parents who do get their children vaccinated, over 96% of them say vaccines are necessary to protect the health of my child. Good for them. Now here's the surprising number. 70% of the parents who opted out of the vaccines agree with that statement that vaccines are necessary to protect the health of my child. So if they know that, why are they still opting out? Because they're letting these fears rule the decision. And they portray themselves as being skeptical. The, there could, I just don't trust, there may be. They think, ah, oh, my spidey senses are tingling. Um, <laughs> They're, they're just being skeptics because they're questioning everything when it comes to the health of their child and they're not gonna be fooled by big pharma. But to be perfectly clear, they are not skeptics. Skeptics, of course, are science-minded. Skeptics debunk pseudoscientific claims. They apply scientific rigor to conspiracy theories and they call out those who attempt to profit from them. Rejecting an overwhelming consensus among scientific and medical com communities that the benefits of vaccines strongly outweigh the risks is not skepticism, that is denial. You're gonna come up across these people in your life and in your travels and trying to get um, someone who's so deeply rooted in their misinformation to be open to learning new things can sometimes be very difficult, but here are some possible responses to these 
myths you're going to hear so you can help move these people towards a more educated decision. For those who say it's just too many shots at once, well, it's Dragon Con, so there's not such a thing as too many shots at once. <laughs> but if they say there's too, too many vaccines at once, you can say that children fight up to 6,000 antigens every single day, and they're only exposed to maybe 150 in the whole vaccine schedule. So hypothetically, an infant could handle up to 10,000 vaccines at once, and their immune system would be far more challenged if they actually contracted the disease than if it was prevented by the vaccine. If they're worried about the side effects. Vaccines are rigorously tested by the FDA and they're reviewed by multiple medical organizations to make sure they're safe and effective. A vaccine that was harmful or didn't work wouldn't be approved. And the benefits of vaccines far outweigh the risks. If they say, I just don't trust my doctor, you can say that there's more than one doctor out there. You can get a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth opinion and you can do research online from credible sources. And the information is overwhelming if you're not looking to confirm the bias that you already have. Oh, and if they say they think vaccines cause autism, suppress the rage within you. <laughs> Try not to hulk out and calmly say they don't. And you should be able to stop there, but if they need more information, say, well, the first mention of this idea of vaccines and autism came from a study that was uh, published in 1998 that has since been retracted. They found that the facts that it was based on were falsified. The doctor that wrote it has lost his license. And there is no evidence of a link between vaccines and autism. So you might get somewhere, or you might be talking to someone like this. <laughs> so these people are more than annoying. They're dangerous. And this is why you should care about the decisions they make, because we need to maintain herd immunity. Right? That means a very large percentage of the population must be vaccinated, and if not, this is going to impact you and going to impact your children. When it comes to the vaccine discussions, there's always a lot of talk about personal choices and personal freedoms, and individual freedom and personal choice are, of course, core American values, but we have always drawn the line when one person's choice harms or kills another. You're an individual, but we are a society and communicable, communicable diseases are very social. They are spread between people. They don't respect individual rights. They don't respect state lines. They don't respect personal beliefs and they certainly don't respect your religion. Anytime a policy affects all Americans, it has to be evidence-based and religiously neutral. And the government has a responsibility to protect the public health, especially in a taxpayer-funded institution like a public school. Unnecessary exemptions accommodate ideological beliefs over children's safety and public health. Unnecessary exemptions put those who cannot be vaccinated at risk of deadly and highly contagious diseases. And the parents whose religious beliefs, that they don't give them license to put their children and other children and the entire community at risk. If this isn't enough to convince you, let me introduce you to Brandt. Brandt and his twin brother were born prematurely in an under-vaccinated area. They were too young for vaccination during a measles outbreak. Their parents were incredibly careful and they were very lucky to not be exposed. As soon as they could, his parents got him and his brother Sebastian vaccinated against whooping cough. They've done everything right. Sebastian's doing fine. Brandt's vaccine didn't take, and he caught whooping cough, and he became very, very sick. It's going to be months before Brandt fully recovers. He's lucky that he's getting the best treatment possible, but he's in severe risk. 
his cough and the rattling in his chest will last for at least 100 days. And these are the parents that did everything they could to protect their children. They did everything right and they still suffered because of the denial of others. As a community, we have to stand up and we have to protect these children. And uh, Brand is, is the son of a board member of the Secular Coalition. And we see him, uh, we've seen him and his parents at conferences and, and they come around. They're a member of this community who is hurt by those outside this community in denial. We are not insulated from this. And like the woman in that gif, you can't always change their minds. Some people are really settled in their ways, their heads are stuck in the sand, and trying to give them all the information in the world can be like spitting into the wind. But the laws, we know we can change the laws because we have already done it. The Secular Coalition for California was a big part of getting the law changed there. They helped pass SB 277, and that bill rolled back all non-medical vaccine exemptions. And we're taking a look, thank you. We're taking a look at what we did there, what worked, what didn't, and we're spreading it across the country. We're gonna make this happen. So let's get to work, let's fix this. Here's where you can start. Secular.org slash put kids first. That is gonna be your central resource for information, for action alerts, for spreading the word. We have uh, a wealth of information from reliable sources. We have social media. It's the new grassroots organizing platform using Facebook, Twitter, however you can to share information about this campaign. You can share your story. If you've been affected by uh, the under vaccination personally, if you have a family member, if you're a health professional, if you're a teacher, please share your story because uh, obviously the data is all there and it takes these kind of personal stories to move legislators and decision makers to action. You can volunteer to help if you can um, phone bank or if you're social media savvy, you can register for action alerts. These are incredibly important and I have a, a sign up sheet um, here today. When there is a bill moving, the other side squeaks really loud and we need to be the squeakier wheel on this because they've been speaking up for years with this misinformation and if we don't start saying something about it, we're gonna continue to just have to suffer for, for what they're being louder about. We'll send you an email when a bill's moving, a few clicks of your mouse, two minutes of your time, and you can shoot off an email right to your legislator. And you can support the campaign. If you can't contribute time, a donation goes a long way to create informational materials, help support doing the, the research so we, we can be putting accurate information out there, help us grow the campaign coalitions, and really make our voices heard. And we have uh, a really lucky opportunity right now. We have a supporter who's put up a $50,000 grant if we can raise $50,000 to match it. This is only for the next few weeks, so if you're able, um, please speak with me today and help us secure this $50,000 grant so that we can make this campaign, take what happened in California and spread it across the country. Right now is just the perfect time uh, to give and help us help, us help Brant. Um, who right there is, is put it in the face of president of American Atheist, David Silverman. So he's got a bright future in our community. <laughs> uh, the reason we had that success in California was because of the volunteers and the people on the ground. It's not the, the people sitting in the big tall offices, it's the people who are talking to the others they know, who are showing up, who are signing petitions, who are sending emails to their legislators. They're the ones that get things done. You're the ones that are gonna get this done. You can make this happen. You can make a difference. You guys can change the world. So let's get to work. Thank you. I'm happy to, to oh, take questions. There's a microphone right there. Yeah, we can hear if you don't. Okay.
Am I on? Yes. Okay. Hey, Kelly. Um, you know me. I'm, we've we've spoken before. I'm Angie Mack. Doctor Angie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an Angie. I'm an emergency physician. And um, have you spoken with professional societies about co gaining a coalition? American College of Emergency Physicians, yes. American Academy of Pediatrics. The American Academy of P Pediatrics. We are. Um, working with right now, the uh, AMA American Medical Association. We're also working with a lot of the, the parent and teacher organizations, the PTA, the school boards. Yeah, the, obviously the, the schools want this as much as anyone. They want the, the kids coming in to be safe and healthy. Um, and the, yeah, the American Pediatrics um, Association is really helping us get connected with local doctors to help um, spread the word amongst them. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think this is really important for vaccines. My um, husband has cystic fibrosis, so he needs everybody in his community to get the flu shot because um, he could die from that disease. My only concern is considering talking to people who have a personal belief with any religious belief. I feel like as someone who's an atheist, you need to be very kind and respectful right. because I feel like the best way to get across to someone is to acknowledge their belief and not belittle it, right. but at the same time also be like, uh, enlighten them to this um, uh, danger that they might not necessarily perceive. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I find really interesting is how it's more of the affluent community that really is yes. involved in this. Um, where I live is in Western Mass, um, very hippie town. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of homeopathic remedy places, chiropractic shops. I mean, great doctors too. Mm -hmm. um, but I, one day I went to um, uh, my doctor and was maybe talking about having a child and she took a big deep breath because she was going to have the vaccine talk. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh no, no, I, I, I totally did that. And she's like, she had this huge sigh of relief. Right. <laughs> um, but I just feel like, especially with any sort of belief system, you just have to be really kind, yet get your point of cross. Right. Because if you're like, you're stupid, you're you're not going to help the conversation right. or with the, the enlightenment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. People just close their ears if you start right off the bat with, you're wrong and I'm going to tell you why. And like you bring up, this is a really unique and interesting issue because it's not the usual lines of division of us uh, on one side and then evangelical Christians and, and con uh, cons conservative Christians on the other side. This really spans parties and we're, we're seeing it, like you said, a lot in middle and upper middle class affluent uh, suburban families. and. I mean, you're right, you're right on the nose about how to bring it up. That, um, I will say it, we're not, there aren't a lot of religions that actually have in their beliefs that you can't be vaccinated. It's a teeny, teeny percent of them. More we're seeing parents use those as a loophole because they, they don't have to do usually anything, um, check a box or just say verbally when they register their kid for school, when they say, oh, have they been vaccinated? Uh, no, I'm taking the exemption. Okay. And that's it. So they're using those as, as opportunities to not go forth and do more of the research, but, ah, you know, I heard something about this and they don't realize the impact that it's having and the people in our society that are really at risk and the level of risk that they're at. So when you come at them and, and start with, you know, we're talking about the life of, of someone I love, it opens their ears and their hearts um, to, to have a more productive conversation. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I, this actually kind of dovetails with what you just said, really, um, because I know a lot of Catholic schools that do require vaccinations, mm. and I'm just curious if the Secular Coalition, like, if you can talk more about any work that they've done um, in cohesion with like religious organizations because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's because uh, it seems like it's something that religious organizations themselves do a lot like they may disagree on some things there's certain issues where they come together mm -hmm. and I'm just curious um, how that's worked out in the past we always want to work with our faith allies let me tell you it it turns some heads and opens some doors especially on Capitol Hill when you say oh the atheists and the Baptists are here to talk to you about an issue <laughs> so you <laughs> 
Yeah, I've, I've had that conversation with the lobbyists for the Southern Baptists where we said, let's sit down and find one thing, one thing that we can agree upon. And we found two. <laughs> <laughs> this is not one of them. <laughs> there, there is a huge, there, there's a divide in, in the faith communities on this. A lot of them want to support the, the minority faiths that um, do want to seek this exemption, and it's not a, a rallying point for them by any means, but there are definitely faith groups that are willing to work with us. Um, we're in the early stages of the campaign, so we're focusing right now on outreach to parent groups, school groups, and the medical groups, uh, but we do have a whole section on, on the website where you can sign up and um, for faith allies to, to come and work with us on this. And um, we do work with the the nuns, the N-U-N-S, the, the Catholic nuns in D.C., um, and, and they do work with us on a, a number of issues, and this is going to be one that we're going to be reaching out to them on. Thank you. Oh. Hello. Hi. Uh, um, so I wanted to bring up, oddly enough, one unexpected irrationality that mm. exists within uh, those of us who are pro-vaccine, uh, which you've kind of touched on a little bit before, and I'm hoping that they're actually or is research in this area that I haven't actually seen. Hmm. Um, a, a few months ago, I was talking with a friend who had let me know that she had recently had an elderly relative had died. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, someone who is against vaccines. And the relative had died um, from complications from the flu, where he had gotten the flu from someone else, another elderly person, who did not have a flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this triggered in her mind a lot of the flu vaccines will cause the flu, blah, 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 blah. Um, now, I could have at that point when she mentioned this relative died, I could have pointed out all these websites to describe the facts of the matter. There's no way that she would be convinced. She's not in an emotional state to convince. Um, she will not be for years to come because mm. this just really hits her close emotionally. If she were asked in some study, what is the reasons? what are the reasons that you don't believe the vaccine, such as the slide you put up earlier, mm -hmm. she would be listed in one of these sections, but that's, that wouldn't be a proper characterization mm -hmm. of her reasons to be anti-vaccine. Um, and a lot of times I see these types of discussions, like the, the studies you, you pointed out, as if that's the complete answer. And usually there's an underlying emotional reason. Right. You know, people buy cars for emotional reasons. Very few people look at charts and graphs. Right. So I'm curious if you're aware of that type of research that really gets into the psychology. Uh, I look really strange on the camera doing that. <laughs> Gets it. Um, right. So. Yeah, I, thank you. I definitely, um, I hear what you're saying. That I think what your question made me think about is the, the idea that people are, are afraid of sharks but not afraid of vending machines, and vending machines kill six times as many people each year than sharks do. <laughs> because when you just have that, sense of something being dangerous or uncomfortable, like you just have a, a, an emotional feeling or a nervousness about it. Um, it's not necessary a, oh, here's the reason I'm not going to do this, um, especially when you're asking someone to take a proactive action. They, they don't need a reason to do it. They, any reason not to do it is, is enough to, to get them to stop. Um, I know there's definitely research out there on, on messaging and communication, and um, we have a lot of the resources on the website. I don't have any on the, the tip of my brain at the moment, but I will say that that's part of the, sh the story sharing is um, some, it, it's almost impossible to trump. Eh, it makes me uncomfortable with, but there's all this data to prove why you shouldn't be. You're not going to settle their stomach. But if you say, okay, well, I know that you might have some uncertainty, but I know this is the impact that it's going to have on me or my family or this is what happened to my cousins or my niece or, or something. When you share that personal story, that tends to, in my experience, have a very big impact in comparison to data and, and facts on reaching that emotional center that causes people to actually stand up and act on something. Thank you. Um, I uh, recently had a child, and um, currently, congratulations! Part, oh, thank you. Uh, part of well, actually, my wife did the work. Um, <laughs> part, part, yeah, part of the um, protocol now is get everyone who's going to be around the child a lot vaccinated for pertussis. Just have them go mm -hmm. to Tdap booster or whatever. And 
I know the thing that made it so absolutely everyone did it was, hey guys, it costs between forty and eighty dollars. I have a big pile of money here. Mm. Just go, go do it. Bring me a receipt, and I will do it. So absolutely everyone, you know, did it. A couple of them were happy to take the money. Um, on that note, I know a lot of you are worrying and worrying and lobbying is getting these rich communities to vaccinate. Mm-hmm. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of communities who can't pay that $40, $60 shot for just the Tdap booster among the other ones. Um, is your organization involved in lobbying for subsidies for the poorer organizations, which mm-hmm. are also contributing to the lack of hu- herd mm-hmm. immunity? Or are you guys on the fighting the exemptions only? There are a lot of really good organizations that are working on, on the vaccination part of it, on the actual medical part of it. And we definitely don't want to be doctors. Um, we're operating where we have the expertise, which is uh, translating real human experiences to members of Congress, uh, which is surprisingly difficult. So that, I mean, that's where our focus is on. And uh, while we, you know, encourage people to get vaccinated, we're, we're really uh, about removing a religious ru- loophole from uh, something where there is solid, solid evidence supporting it and keeping our laws religiously neutral. So we're focusing on that end of it and letting um, all the different medical partners focus on doing the, the vaccination clinics and, and the support for um, funding for the, the CDC and other organizations that actually are able to do those vaccine clinics for free for low income areas. Hi. Uh, Hi. Louisiana and West Virginia are not customarily politically aligned with California. So I was wondering how those two states were sold on vaccination and could those techniques be used on other states? California um, was the first state that that stepped back, that the first state to do the repeal. Mississippi and West Virginia never put the the laws on the books. I want to know why as much as anyone else does, because... I had to read that at least 10 times, sleep on it, and look it up again the next day to make sure that that was right, because that that surprised me. And I actually got to uh, see a a senator from Mississippi the next day and talk to her about something good that her state had done and thank her for something, which was something I usually don't get to do with Mississippi's legislators. Uh, So, you know, I don't know the backstory about why they never got an exemption put on the books, but they never had to take it off. So uh, once those kind of exemptions are in there, it's really hard to get them them pulled back, uh, especially in a lot of other areas we work in. This one has such a human connection to it. This is just one where there's a real achievable win possible. Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Baxter, and I do research on why people don't get vaccinated. Wow, um, and hi. I did, hi. <laughs> And I did, and I did two TED talks on the subject. And um, one of the biggest things is that the incidence of needle phobia in this country has risen in a direct graph link um, up with anti-vaccination and the number of vaccines. Sorry. So, so as we're giving more vaccines, more people are afraid of needles, and that actually figures in. You mean literally the needle, not what's inside? No, literally the needle. In fact, Dan Salmon did a study in 2005, and while people said the reasons that were on your slide about why they weren't vaccinating, mm-hmm. the partial vaccinators did accept polio. And the thing mm-hmm. is, polio is hugely antigenic. It's hugely, it's hugely dangerous. But at the time they did the study, those parents were getting an oral polio vaccine. So mm-hmm. they accepted an oral vaccine, but not an injected one. So just, um, we'll talk more, but there's one piece of thought. My actual question is, I'd never seen the statistic of the 600,000 um, if, immunogenic responses versus 150. Mm -hmm. And that was really a compelling statistic. I think what would be really compelling also is um, I'd like to know what the verses are that people cite because um, in everything I've read, they're actually, because all of the religious texts were written at least uh, 1,800 years before we had any inkling of vaccines, Mm -hmm. what are they actually citing that gets used? Um, I know one of the groups that, that gets the exemption, well, the, I think probably the main group is um, Christian scientists, um, who they, they just have a problem with doctors in general. Um, I, I don't know any of the specific biblical passage that they go to to, to find um, that, but I will, find, I will find that out for you, and we should talk more about um, your research and your TED Talks, because I'd really like to know about that. Um, But I also find that um, not necessarily in vaccine communication, but in communication with people of faith, um, 
I have not had a lot of luck pointing out possible inaccuracies or differences between the provisions of the holy text that they're citing and how it might conflict with other provisions of the same holy text or with everything else that we know to be true or anything of that nature, that trying to, to do that strategy of, um, of, of pointing out inaccuracy or possible hypocrisy with actual quotes from a, a, a holy book, um, people tend to dig in deeper on it. Um, and there's a wonderful picking and choosing of the parts of it that you want to apply. And so I tend to, to not go after the, well, you know your belief in this one thing conflicts with your other beliefs um, and keep it to um, the, the commonalities of humanity that they do identify with. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, could you brief us on the status of any possible national legislation that's in process right now? Nationally, it's um, very, very difficult because this is a state-based issue. One thing we have been doing is asking uh, the, the senators and legislators from each state to send letters to the, um, the people who would be in charge of it in their particular state, which changes from, from state to state, but um, kind of uh, sometimes even the attorney general. But we asked uh, the California senators, uh, Barbara Boxer and... Um, Diane Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, uh, to send a similar letter, and that brought a lot of clout with it. So we are trying to get um, national engagement. We're trying to make sure that f um, funding for the CDC and the education campaigns that they do around it, that that stays around. Uh, but it, it, is, it really is such a state-based campaign that we're, we're trying to focus our efforts on the, the local side of it right now. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a social psychologist, and oh. there's a huge sub-area of social psychology that's all about judgment and decision-making. Mm. Um, and I'll just give one example of something that might be helpful. So if you encounter somebody who is kind of just reflexively being like, no, 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 I reject everything you're saying. It's all crap. Uh, kind of the one thing that you can say that can get through to them is say, okay, what could I tell you that would change your mm. mind? And it really forces them to examine their own beliefs. and unquestionably with anti-vax stuff, they're going to be like, well, this. And then we can be like, well, let me pile on five different things that say like that. So there, like I showed you this thing that you said, you know, would change your mind. So that was just my example of okay. there's a ton of research on it. And I, so my question is, how much are you guys aware of that? <laughs> um, and kind of are using that, I hope, to help you formulate your campaign. That research would be, of course, incredibly helpful. We have so many smart people in the room today. It's very helpful. Our, a lot of what we've been um, doing is, is focused on um, not necessarily communicating to between individuals. Um, that's you know a really important part of it to build enough people into a coalition to start a grassroots campaign. Uh, but the content that that we're putting together, the um, issue statements, the action alerts, these lobby sheets, are information to be presented to lawmakers. And um, uh, what we found is that the lawmakers need to hear stories, they need to hear them from their own constituents, from the, the voters who elect them or don't elect them, and that individual stories are what persuade them. Even the most, um, the most intellectual, fact-based, evidence-based person uh, is gonna be persuaded by an adorable baby picture. The research. <laughs> um, so when we're, so we're putting together the content that's going to help the legislators see that this is going to be a popular decision that's going to get them reelected. And if it's something that they stand against, it's not like they're not going to be back next year. And this is what their people want. Those si the arguments that they'll hear. So those are the arguments that we're putting together. Thank you. Hello. Hi. No particular opinion one way or the other on vaccine. It does, you know, but but I am curious about the uh, the the uh, response from California. I understand there's a petition going to uh, to to help fight the 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 bill, and and that could cause mm -hmm. that could considerably confound things. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm just curious about what kind of response is right. being done to help. 
cut down on that? Good question. Uh, the bill uh, passed this House, passed the Senate, and was signed into law by the governor in June. However, there is a movement by the anti-vaxxers in California to repeal the senator that introduced that bill. Um, it, it is gaining some steam because they are focusing all their energies on this, this one bold state senator. And our coalition, who th their, their job there is not done, they now have to then stand up and defend the people who defended the science. And that's what we need, you know, that's what we need to do in California. And then in, we definitely need that person to, that senator to not get recalled out of office because then what other state senator is going to stand up for this? That kind of coalition and rallying around and standing up for something uh, is going to be hugely important there. Hi. Um my son and my family are fully vaccinated. Most of the people that run in our circle are fully vaccinated. One of the things that I run up against, though, is they continue to use this religious exemption, even though none of us are really religious, because they're afraid of a slippery slope of, um, in the future, they'll come up with these vaccines and then make us get them and, you know, big brother and da da, -da. So it's really not anything anti-vax. It's mm. anti-big brother. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if this is like, a completely weird thing that only my friends are talking about, mm -hmm. or is this part of what you're also fighting against? This is definitely a, a an argument that we hear that um, as if it's an it's a new big government push to make everybody get vaccinated. But uh, the mandatory vaccination started in the the late 50s, 60s, and what you see are those those graphs that I showed of the, the whooping cough and measles slowly curving up, that they were high. And as soon as vaccinations uh, became, well, came into existence and then became mandatory, they dropped. Particularly um, the federal government. There are a lot of uh, people who argue against the, the right of the federal government to do anything about this, but public health is one of the basic things that the government is allowed to protect, public health and safety. And this is a very big public health and safety issue. I mean, if, if we drop too low and lose our, our herd immunity, um, it could devastate society. And it'll look like some of the apocalypse rising characters that we have out here. Uh, it will, uh, no one has the right to cause an epidemic. That's not something you have the individual right to do. And the government is allowed to stand up and protect the public health, and this is just a, such a basic issue. You don't have the religious right to run red lights. That, that doesn't make any sense. Um, thank you. Yeah, I should write that down. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's right along those lines. When it's something that is not entirely individual but impacts everyone around you, that's when um, the government's going to protect the public health. Um, earlier we were talking a little bit about um, the religious passages. Someone asked mm -hmm. who uses that. Uh, basically what makes that actually really interesting, um, Christian scientists have a really weird uh, symbiotic relationship with atheism. Um, if you mm. really care to get into Gnosticism and the problem of evil and all of that, there's a woman, Mary Baker Eddy. I'm actually really, really, really familiar with all that because it was part of my uh, atheism journey, how I ended up leaving faith. Hmm. But um, essentially, it, they profess that there can't be any evil um, and that there is no need for salvation because God can't be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good and have evil exist. So most atheists arrive at the conclusion that God doesn't exist. They arrive at the conclusion evil doesn't, and therefore medicine and even acknowledging anything is going to make you sick because you're acknowledging things that don't exist. So anyway, I just thought that was really interesting because the people that are using that as an exemption, that's the faith they're actually claiming to be affiliated with a lot of times when they have to write it down, but they don't even understand it enough to even know what the basic foundation is. So I just thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. that that's the route that a lot of people are going because most Christian scientists that I, I knew growing up actually have become atheist because they just flipped that argument. So that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. The another children's health issue that we work on a lot are um, exemptions for and 
parents, and this is often with Christian science parents, um, from being charged with child abuse or neglect because they don't take their children to the doctors, to the doctor, and there's their entire, not to really bring it down, but their entire graveyards of um, Christian science children that the parents just let them perish mm -hmm. um, because they, they believe in faith healing and if they just pray on it, that it'll fix it. And while that problem is uh, incredibly serious, it, it isn't as widespread at the moment, but that's another issue that we do a lot of work on and it's terrifying and terrible. You made a comment about going to the Baptist to try to find common ground on this, but mm -hmm. you couldn't. Can you expand on why you couldn't? Mm -hmm. What you kind of touched on it, but expand on why that wouldn't yeah. happen. And I think I know why. But if you that would be the political arm of the Baptist. If you went to maybe the general mm -hmm. public of the Baptists, mm. I, I wonder if that would influence their, you know, Thanks. their top dogs. Um, there's also there's the the two type of types of bath Baptists, um, there's the official names, but there's like the Jimmy Carter Baptist and then like the, the real Southern Baptist. Well, Anabaptist too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so in DC, there's um, one of the, the coalitions that we are part of puts all the religious groups that have a DC presence at the table, the Christian scientists and the Baptists, but also um, there's represent Jewish representation, uh, Sikh, Hindu, everybody. And what we're finding is that specifically the, the I don't say fringe, but uh, more minority sections of the Christian faiths tend to really bond together and have each other's backs, even if it's not a tenant of their own faith. So one of the things, for example, the Christian scientists are trying to, to do right now is get an exemption from um, having to pay the, uh, the penalty under Obamacare if you don't have an individual health insurance because, again, they don't believe in doctors, so they don't want to buy health insurance. and they're getting support from other minority Christian groups um, so that when they have, the Baptists have a particular issue that comes up, they know someone else that has their backs. Uh, we work uh, with the Hindu Foundation and we work with um, a lot of the different uh, Jewish groups and the more, we tend to, to align more with the, the liberal uh, religious organizations on the issues that we work on. Um, yeah, so it's it's like a middle school cafeteria in DC sometimes. Uh, and, and that's the reason that they're not working with us on this issue, not because it's part of their faith or not even because they disagree with us, but because they have to have their friends back should they need them in the future. That's DC for you.